Okay, very good. Welcome, Pia. Thanks, everyone, for bearing with us. You're welcome to, to go straight to the podium if you okay. like to start with your presentation. You have uh, 25 minutes, please. So, uh, sorry for the delay, everyone. Uh, thanks to the organizers for inviting me. I'm actually, while coming here by train, I realized that I had been an intern 10 years ago at the ECB. And I was driving by here and it was still a working process. So, happy to be back uh, in another role, though, this time. Um, let's jump straight into... You, you, the slides will come in a second there. Okay, great. So uh, what I'm going to present uh, to you today is uh, actually uh, co-authored work with Matthias Kaldorf, who sits in the audience. Uh, so um, any questions can also be, I guess, answered by him. Um, we will talk about real effects of financial market integration evidence from an ECB collateral framework change. And uh, as an introduction, uh, basically um, the idea, what we have behind this uh, collateral uh, usage in a very um, uh, normal and simple way. Uh, so uh, basically you have uh, banks uh, which pledge collateral against, uh, um, um, if they want to participate in main refinancing operations of the ECB. And uh, this is the type of collateral that we, that, that we are looking at, uh, just to uh, make a clear distinction of uh, what uh, was discussed before. Somehow um, it's, another, it's, a no, it's a more like a, a simpler role of collateral. Um, and so in, uh, the idea behind this is that we have a financial market union actually uh, in, um, in, in a, mon in a um, monetary union. If there, is a, there, if there is no fiscal union, then you would actually need financial market integration. Uh, why? Because like this, uh, you basically um, uh, allow that private sector funding conditions are independent of local Bank, of the local banking system. Um, however, out there, there's really little knowledge about uh, the microeconomics behind a financial integration. And so we zoom in into one aspect. We, uh, aspect. we take you back a very uh, long time ago. Uh, in 2007, there was a policy change at the ECB, which implemented a harmonized collateral policy. And we used this framework change as a quasi-natural experiment. Uh, so, um, to give you uh, a short overview of what policy change we are interested in, the ECB basically implements monetary policy through national central banks. And before 2007, so you had the euro, obviously, but uh, you didn't have a collateral, um, you, you didn't have a, a unified collateral uh, system. So basically, before 2007, you had a two-tier system, where in the first tier you had assets, uh, for example, uh, government bonds, which were always eligible, so they were sort of the same throughout the euro area. In the uh, tier two, uh, you actually had assets uh, that were under the full discretion of the National Central Bank. And so this, uh, on one hand, accounts for the peculiarities of the local banking sector. So, for example, Germany is a good example for this. Uh, but at the same time, it also is problematic because it segments the market, right? And so, uh, depending on, as a bank, where you were headquartered, you um, could only pledge certain types of, of collaterals. And um, the um, asset we are really interested in are, are actually bank loans. So before the 2007 changeover, you only had domestic bank loans that were accepted by some uh, national central banks. In others, you really could not pledge uh, domestic bank loans. Uh, so this can also be interpreted as an additional source of, of home bias. And it actually, coming back to what I was saying before, it uh, sort of violates the no sudden stop condition that you have in a financial uh, in a financial uh, market union. And so, um, after two thousand and seven, uh, what happens? The ECB actually uh, unifies the collateral framework and introduces a single list, a single list of uh, of, of collateral. And the consequence is that, for example. Um, German banks can now pledge uh, loans granted to Spanish firms. 
So in fact, uh, bank loans were one of the biggest novelties uh, in this, uh, in this uh, single list, uh, because as of now, you could uh, pledge domestic bank loans, and especially you could pledge cross-border bank loans. So um, if the borrower that you were um, giving money to uh, was inside the euro area, you could pledge it. Before, it was only possible domestically. And so this actually relaxes funding constraint for banks. And at the same time, it also increases the pool uh, 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 for firms of banks that they have access to, right? And so in this paper, uh, we look at how uh, the single list affected banks' credit supply. We look at how it affected cross-border banking, uh, cross-border lending, and then we look at the real effects in the non-financial sector. And the preview of the results is that um, how did it impact credit supply? So we use a different diff setup and um, banks holding eligible assets. These are basically our affected banks. They increased their lending by 10.6% compared to banks without such eligible assets after the framework change. Um, which firms experience the most inflow? So what uh, we uh, can show you is that it's mostly eligible borrowers that were previously in the collateral pool uh, that experienced those inflows. And the real effects on the firm level, we have that um, we find effects both on the employment and on the investment side. Uh, for the related literature, uh, I'm going to make it short, but um, basically we are um, contributing to two strands of literature. The first one is um, cross-border uh, credit flows. So here we, uh, we have uh, in mind uh, Janetti and Leuven, for example, which look at how uh, local funding conditions actually influence uh, the so-called home, um, the so-called flight abroad or flight home effect. And um, we also look at uh, the, the European integration uh, here, Hoffman uh, and Sorison, uh, for example. Um, and however, what we contribute to this literature is that um, there is a small effect of this harmonized cross, uh, collateral policy on cross-border lending, because we do find that banks not only lend to their um, uh, of the pool of borrowers they had before, but they do extend uh, cross-border lending. And the second strand of literature we uh, contribute to is actually the bank lending channel and collateral policy. So there are other papers uh, which have looked at collateral policy already before. Uh, one, for example, from Beckham, Gabaro and Irani, uh, they looked at the um, residential backed uh, assets uh, and, and bank lending in, in the Dutch market, for example. Uh, and the third strand is uh, about real effects. And here, uh, Pelitson, who's, who, who's this discussant, actually has a, has, a, has a paper on how the um, corporate bond uh, purchases sort of uh, affect uh, um, the, financing, uh, the financing decisions of firms. And so what we want to show is that collateral policy affects uh, banks, and you can see this by uh, an increase in employment and investment. So um, I have already talked a bit about the institutional framework. Um, I'll just um, uh, now go to the data. And so we look at a syndicated uh, loan market. Why? Because syndicated loan market is actually uh, quite widely used when you look at cross-border banking flows. The idea is here that you have multiple banks that lend to one borrower. And um, uh, we uh, look uh, at syndicated loan also because syndicated loans were part of uh, being included in that list. So actually, uh, as a bank, you could pledge syndicated loans uh, afterwards. Um, the institutional framework is also that the change, the very nice thing about this change, I'm trying to convince you also about this, is that it's, it took effect in January 2007. And so it should be a uh, crisis unrelated. We also have a very small uh, window. Uh, we also look just at qu four quarters before and four quarters after. So we really try to not have the financial crisis as a confounding factor. Um, 
the borrowers are non-financial firms, uh, where 54% uh, of them are actually uh, headquartered in the euro area. And uh, we merge data set uh, in a standard procedure from DealScan, CapitalIQ, and CompuStat. Uh, the sample period is from 2003 to 2008. We have about around 1,700 firms. Um, and uh, we have that banks lend uh, two-thirds domestically and one-third uh, to other euro area banks. So. Uh, the empirical strategy, it's a, it's a diff and diff, uh, and our uh, treatment and control group are basically defined by their issuance history. Because uh, our, the idea behind here is that um, banks which already issue in the uh, cross-border, uh, so banks which already issue to other euro area borrowers, so excluding the domestic part, um, they are actually, they should be the most affected by this framework change. And so we construct our affected measure by um, looking at the issuance history of um, banks giving out uh, credits to other area non-domestic non borrowers over all uh, credit that they give out. And the issuance uh, history is from 2003 to 2005 Q2. And um, we then do a median split, so basically uh, we define our banks to be affected if they have an above uh, median issuance history. Uh, the identifying assumption here is really that um, unaffected banks do not change uh, business model in response to the collateral framework change. And we estimate both in terms of loan, uh, loan issuance and in terms of uh, interest rate spreads uh, we, est we estimate the following um, equation. So it's uh, basically uh, our dependent variable of interest, so uh, loan volume or, or interest rate times um, uh, our treatment variable times post. And we include, um, to alleviate some concerns, we include uh, bank level controls. So the concern might be that there is no random treatment assignment and we also include bank firm fixed effects to account for um, different borrow characteristics and um, we also include firm quarter fi fixed effects in the spirit of Quajamian so we take out the loan demand. We also um, include, it, it's, it's not on this slide anymore, but we also include a very stringent uh, industry uh, country fixed effects in the spirit of the Greise 2019. So to show you the parallel trends, a parallel trends basically is to underline uh, the validity of our uh, diff and diff. And here uh, you can see the loan volume. And uh, as you can see, um, there is a little bump going upwards, but uh, it's, it's uh, actually not uh, significant. So you can still uh, argue that um, the issuance behavior of both the affected and the unaffected banks is uh, is the same before the framework change happened. After the framework change, you see that both start diverging. Uh, the same uh, is what uh, you can see in terms of interest rates. Again, here, there is no, um, the, the, the difference between our uh, treatment and control group is, is, uh, is null, basically, before the framework change and after the framework change, you see a dip in the interest rate spread. So uh, our main table is basically uh, the, 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 the following here. We have um, the credit supply as a dependent variable and we interact our affected measure with uh, the post framework change measure. And what you can see is that we have um, a highly significant coefficient throughout uh, all our uh, models, uh, we basically just add more stringent fixed effects uh, going from column one to column two to column three. And so in column uh, two, actually, uh, you have the um, model with a firm time fixed effects. And in column three, you have uh, quantity times industry times time fixed effects. And as you can see, the coefficient does not change that much. And we find that uh, banks uh, uh, which are affected by the framework change increase their lending uh, by around 10% uh, compared to banks uh, which were not affected by the framework change. 
we also include a list of bank level and loan level controls, which didn't have space on this slide, so I just wrote it. But um, the interest rate spread is basically here we just change the dependent variable and we look at um, the spread of the uh, loan uh, above the LIBOR, basically that's the reference um, rate in, in, in that market. And what we find is that uh, given that banks have a positive funding shock, right? We, uh, the first hypothesis is that through this positive funding shock, they increase the loan supply and at the same time they should decrease uh, the interest rate spread, right? And so this is actually what we find as well. Uh, in terms of basis points, we find that uh, banks reduce the interest rate spread by 12 basis points. Um, looking at the borrower location, we uh, were interested in um, where uh, the borrower is located. And um, here we basically uh, make a sample split, so it's uh, the same uh, specification than before, but we just uh, define borrowers if they were already previously eligible or if they are newly eligible. And what we can see is that banks um, sort of used this framework change to give out more money to the borrowers that were already previously eligible, but also a bit to borrowers that were newly eligible. Why do I say just a bit? Because if you look at the magnitude, it's basically one tenth if you look at the newly eligible. And the newly eligible is mainly the non-domestic euro area borrowers. And so this is sort of our um, hint at how this collateral framework uh, change actually increased cross-border lending. Um, we then uh, go to the um, uh, how am I with the time? Is it? Uh, you have eight minutes. Okay, great. That's perfect. Okay, we, we basically do the same at the firm level. So uh, we um, uh, look at the same coin, but just from the firm level side. And uh, here we define exposed. So a firm being exposed to an affected bank is basically we look at the amount of loan that a firm gets from affected banks. Okay, so um, we again look at the time period between 2003 and 2005 and we have loans from affected banks over all loans and again we do a median split so firms with an above median share of uh, of loans coming from those affected banks actually they are classified as exposed okay and here um we uh, basically have again uh, loan issuance so the probability of uh, in this time it's the probability of a firm getting a loan uh, uh, times beta one uh, here the coefficient of interest is uh, actually the interaction between our exposed measure and the post again we include this time firm controls uh, and we work with industry time fixed effects and country time fixed effects as well as firm fixed effects. And what we find is that uh, we have some uh, credit supply, some positive uh, credit supply, and uh, we also have real effects in terms of uh, employment and tangible assets. And so um, in the first slide, what you can see is uh, basically the the, the, the other side of the coin of what I showed you on the bank firm level. Uh, this is on the, on the firm level. Again, we see a positive uh, impact. So firms uh, with a relationship to affected banks actually uh, have an increase in the probability of getting a loan. Uh, same in terms of loan volume. They uh, experience a positive increase in, in loan volume. Uh, and for the real effects, actually here we... Uh, this is still a bit in the making, but here we basically want to know who are the borrowers that uh, experience um, uh, most of the, um, uh, of the benefits. And we, uh, we try to split the borrowers into the tradable, non-tradable sector uh, as a proxy as well, uh, risky or non-risky. And so here what I show you is the tradable, non-tradable. And what we find that both in terms of employment and tangible assets, actually, if we split the sample into those, we find also some real effects. So it's mostly uh, firms in the tradable sectors, which 
uh, with a relationship to affected banks which experience an increase both in terms of employment and in terms of um, tangible assets. We also did a bunch of robustness checks. Uh, I don't think I have time to go through all of them, but I just want to show you two or three which uh, I think uh, should, um, should sort of um, convince you about our story. So the first one is um, when there was this um, collateral change, actually the, the idea that we had is that we would only look at uh, something that was a novelty for all banks, and that was that they could now pledge cross-border uh, loans. However, uh, for countries like Italy, they actually uh, could not pledge, not even domestic loans before this collateral change. And so uh, it could be that, you know, once Italian banks could pledge domestic loans, that it is really that which is driving our results and not the, um, the cross-border uh, pledge. And so what we do here is that we just construct our affected measure again, including also uh, the part where banks um, can uh, pledge the domestic part newly. So that's basically an Italian fixed effects, uh, so, so, so to say. And what you can see is still that our results um, hold and, and, are, and are quite constant. Um, we then do a triple interaction of this just to see what drives what and um, here the results disappear which means that um, it's not the domestic part which is uh, explaining our results it's really this uh, euro area cross-border um, pledge um, eligibility the possibility of uh, um, pledging cross-border uh, loans which drives our results um, one other thing I also would like to show you is a placebo test. So what we did is that we constructed a fake uh, affected measure for um, banks not part of the euro area. So mostly, actually, it's 2007, so it's mostly UK banks still in the EU. Uh, it's, uh, we just look at uh, European Union banks not being part of the euro area. And we con con construct the same measure. And the idea is that ECB monetary policy, especially a framework change, should impact only um, euro area banks, right? And so here we do not find results. And that's actually good because it means that we really do find a, pecu a peculiar thing just for euro area banks. And we also change a bit the affected measures. We define it over total assets. We also look at the continuous treatment variable as a share, and we do find always consistent, positive, and significant results. Um, as a last check, we look at the whole sample where we don't look at term loans, but sort of uh, revolving loans and things like this, and we also don't, don't find uh, results. So let me conclude. Uh, we look at uh, harmonizing collateral policy as one aspect of uh, banking union uh, and our, our idea behind this is that an increase in um, uh, collateral actually uh, leads to a positive funding shock uh, for banks and so we should find uh, positive results on the loan level and this is what we, what we find. We find that it increases bank lending and it increases bank lending also cross-border. Our results also suggest some positive real effects. What are the downside of being a single list? Well, um, cross-border capital uh, could fuel unsustainable credit booms. This is what we have seen in the run-up uh, of the financial crisis. But uh, we don't have any counterfactual. This is a different diff. And um, the limitations of our analysis, and I want to be very clear about this, is that local funding conditions still diverged after 2008. So uh, collateral policy definitely was not the silver bullet to um, sort of uh, resolve the uh, n n sudden stop condition in the euro area. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much. Thank you, Pia. If you would like to take a seat. Uh, so to discuss the paper, uh, we have uh, Professor Loriana Pelizon from the Goethe University Frankfurt, who will be joining remotely. And uh, 
I hope, Loriana, you can you can hear us and we can hear you. I can definitely hear you. I'm just trying to share my slide. So good uh, good morning to everybody. I hope that you are able to see my slides. It's fine. Not yet, but we're getting there. But we can hear you. So that's a, a first step. Good. So thank you very much for inviting me to discuss this paper. Are you hearing me? Everything is fine. Uh, yes, we can hear you well, uh, Loriana, but just give us a second to uh, switch the, the screen slides. here so we can, uh, yes. we can see the slides. Yes, yes. So, uh, you know, it is a very interesting paper. Uh, it has been presented very well. Uh, and uh, the, the only concern that I have is that clearly uh, the version that I have of the paper is not the last one. So part of my comments uh, maybe are not uh, really uh, related to what you just saw about the paper. But anyway, uh, what is this paper trying to do is to, the main focus at least, this is what is claimed in the title, is to estimate the real effects of the harmonized collateral policy that the ECB has been introduced in 2007. And they are trying to measure real effects by looking to employment. And uh, uh, the, the, the key focus uh, that uh, it was at least in the in the version of the paper that they read, it was on uh, 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 whether this change in the uh, collateral list uh, create any cross-border credit provision, so any effect across both borders. And uh, as you, in some sense, uh, uh, observe uh, by the presentation, but it has changed a little bit in terms of, of the results, uh, it seems that indeed this list, changing the list has been improved uh, uh, the banking union, if you want. So core countries, banks uh, uh, lend more to peripheral countries, reducing their own bias. And uh, uh, this was pretty much the result in the version that I read of the paper. They do send me the slides, but it was yesterday afternoon. And, uh, you know, for me it was very difficult to understand what there was there. Um, so. What's coming out by this change of the list is that the credit supplies has been increased uh, largely to uh, riskier and less productive firms uh, in peripheral countries. But uh, this has also generated an increase in employment and investment. And uh, as you observe in the results, the cost of credit has been reduced by 12 basis points. So uh, I think that the topic is extremely important and it is uh, uh, really helping us to understand how important are these eligible lists set up by the ECB. So clearly the topic is very interesting and I'm working a lot on this topic on the corporate bond side, on the sovereign bond side. And I think that this paper is very complementary to this type of literature because it's really focusing on uh, the, the lending part that so far has not been investigated. And, uh, uh, but, but my point, my first point is that uh, the main purpose of, of the ECB for creating a unique list was to improve monetary policy transmission. And uh, I wonder if really this paper is able to answer to this question, you know, it's trying to see if we have any real effect, but it would be nice also to figure out if also monetary policy transmission has been improved thanks to uh, this change of the eligibility list, moving from uh, the fragmented list at the national level into a unique list at the ECB level. Then there is another aspect that uh, uh, I think it is important to, to, to stress. Uh, the, the change in the eligibility list happens on January 2007. But uh, even if the global financial crisis is associated with uh, uh, let's say the, the Lehman default that was in September 2008, so let's say two years after this change or let's say um, one year and one half after the change of this eligible list, actually the crisis started in uh, August 2007. Uh, I don't know, you know, it's funny because when I'm asking to my students when the global financial crisis started, most of them are answering September 2010 because they are related to uh, they related to, to the Lima uh, default, but actually the main crisis started on the 8th, 9th of August 2007 when BNP Paribas, so Europe, went to the ECB 
asking money because he was not able to raise any money in the interbank market at that time. Uh, and he needs this money mostly to provide funding to his collect connected hedge funds that was largely exposed on asset baked corporate uh, commercial papers. So, and you know, the proof is this graph. This is reporting the three month LIBOR oil spread. And as you can see, there was a, a huge increase of the spread by 100 basis points in pretty much one day, exactly in uh, uh, August 2007. So why I'm talking about this? Well, because, you know, when you're looking to the difference and the improvement, uh, you're looking to, even when you are shorting your, uh, your uh, windows, you're looking to one year before and one year after till the fourth quarter of 2007. But the fourth quarter of 2007 is including already two quarters that are subject to the crisis. And in fact, if you're looking to your uh, results, well, you can see that maybe there is something in the first two quarters, but already at the third and the fourth quarters, the results are not anymore there. So, you know, you have that pretty much uh, the increase in lending and the impact on the spread shade away, uh, starting exactly from the third quarter of 2007. So I wonder if, uh, you know, the result that you are showing to us is just driven by the first two quarters and then clearly the crisis prevents you to, to have any, uh, let's say, uh, um, possibility to do any empirical analysis on the implication of this uh, change in the, in the uh, eligibility list. Then I have several other questions regarding the paper. The first is that, uh, um, you know, since all the story is based on the fact that uh, by changing the eligibility list, banks are now able to use different assets, uh, uh, different loans than before. Uh, well, you should be able to answer to this question by looking indeed if banks are now pledging new loans to the ECB. You know, being at, the, uh, at least at the Bundesbank, uh, you should have this type of information. So it will be very interesting to see not only if they increase lending, but because there are the possibilities of why the increased lending can be several, but the key point is, are they really using uh, and how much, uh, you know, the loans that they had that before they cannot use as uh, uh, collateral uh, now in order to get uh, uh, new funding from the, the ECB. So pretty much look to the loans that before January 2007 would not be considered pledgeable at the ECB, at least in some countries, and document that indeed after January 2007, banks do pledge these loans at the ECB. This will be, you know, uh, very uh, interesting because it will show that indeed there was an impact and how much. Uh, then I have some question about uh, the result that you have uh, uh, on uh, cross-border lending. Uh, I don't know how robust is this result, but it seems that cross-border lending is increasing, but uh, largely for riskier and less productive firms. And, you know, I'm not debating if this result is true or not. My question is, why is this the case? So, uh, it is because these are the only available option for non-incumbent banks. So, you know, if you are a foreign bank that start to lend more on uh, uh, for to firms on in other countries, clearly, at least at the beginning, you will have the leftovers because you know all the story regarding relationship with lendings and so on will tell you that it will be very difficult for the new banks to come and pledge away uh, lending uh, to firms that are very good. So clearly, it, I would like to, to see something more about this. Uh, uh, this result and, and also it will be nice to, to investigate more how competition among banks has been changed due to the unique list. So, you know, they start to uh, lend in places where they were not lending too much or they have the capacity now to lend more to these other areas. Uh, how this is changing the competition, you know, what is going on there, it will be very interesting to, to, to investigate. And, then I have another question, you know, uh, before, let's say, August 2007, in Europe, we were having a good interbank market. And the interbank market at the time, it was, uh, it was 
yes, cluster a little bit at the country level, but there was a lot of cross-border lending among banks that then it has been, uh, let's say, freeze up and, uh, uh, and destroyed with the, with the global financial crisis. But uh, one question that then I will be curious to know is that why the interbank market was not enough for transferring funding uh, that in some sense was some funding surplus cross-border before. So what, what was going on here? Why the interbank market was not enough to uh, provide this type of, uh, let's say, cross-funding? And you need to have a unique eligible list in order to improve lending across countries. And, uh, and also, how much is important for banks to try to exploit this possibility in terms of diversification of their portfolio? Uh, is, is really banks that now are able to diversify more the ones that are doing exploiting these possibilities or are some other? So, you know, what are the main drivers? Uh, still, this paper, I think, is not telling us uh, completely the story. And then going back to some of the res uh, regression, you know, you show that there is some statistical significance. And then, for example, for... Uh, um, for the lending, there is an increase of lending by 10% with respect to before. Uh, but how economically significant are, are these results? How many billions are we lending more thanks to this, uh, uh, let's say, um, changing the uh, eligibility limits? You know, and uh, because on the other side, from the spread, 12 basis points seems important. But we are talking usually about 200 basis points. So, you know, if you're considering that there is a lot of dispersion, maybe these 12 basis points are not so relevant. And then this impact is not so permanent. It is true that it's due to the crisis that we have after. But I wonder if indeed there was just a, a, a short term effect or if we are continuing or not to see this type of cross border effect thanks to this eligibility limits change. And also regarding the riskiness of, of the firm, you're looking to the return on asset, but I think that uh, you should think to some other measure for this type of, uh, uh, let's say, indicators. And uh, finally, the title seems, you know, uh, to induce the reader to expect a lot of analysis on the real effect of the change in eligibility list. But actually this result is arriving only at the end and in fact, also in your presentation, you just present one slide regarding to this result. So I wonder if really the focus of your paper is on real, the real effects or simply on uh, the increase in credit and lending uh, due to this eligibility list or, you know, uh, something else. So um, either the title will be more broad or the focus has to be really just on uh, or mostly on the real effects of your analysis your analysis for the change of the eligibility list. But in any case, very interesting paper. I'm learning a lot and I think that is contributing significantly to the literature because it's really looking to one part of this, uh, let's say, of the change in the eligibility list in use by the ECB that has not been investigated before. So thank you very much. So Thank you very much, Loriana. Um, a lot of uh, questions, so uh, I'm sure you, Pia, you're keen to get back to some of these points. But if you allow, we, we take one or two, if there are uh, questions also from the audience, and then uh, we give the floor back to you for uh, collective response. So any, any questions? Jean-David and Francesco. So can we have the, the mic, please? Yes. Just a, a, a quick question. Um, so on your, your presentation, you talked about affected and non-affected uh, entities. I think there's a, there's a probability that there, there is no such thing as uh, non-affected entities in the sense that if you think that there's a market for such uh, assets and, and, and there's a competition for, this, for these assets, um, the affected are, are now now have an advantage to hold these assets and the non-affected have a disadvantage. They don't have this advantage and they are losing out. And why am I saying this is that um, you may double counting 
um, you may be uh, double counting the effect in terms of uh, volume in the sense that the affected will increase their holding of these assets and what you call the non-affected will decrease the holding of these assets and your diff and diff will double count uh, the effect. I think econometrically it's probably fine, but when you discuss the magnitude, uh, especially in terms of volume, I would be uh, careful um, about this, this potential um, effect. Thank you. Thank you, Jean-David. Uh, Francisco? Great presentation. Um, once you're done with all the comments of Loriana, <laughs> going back to one of your early slides that you contribute to several strands of literature, could you be also looking at uh, the impact uh, on resharing within the EU, especially the euro area, the, um, the knock-on effect on uh, FTIs, uh, intra-euro area FTIs, uh, which were very high, and, uh, but especially resharing. Thanks. Okay, thank you, Francesco. I think we, we, we uh, conclude the collection of questions now because we're uh, also running out of time, so we can give uh, Pia the chance to uh, respond. Yes, okay, so um, thanks, Loriana, for, for your um, presentation. Uh, you are actually the, the best uh, discussant we could have hoped for because we, I, we obviously know your work about uh, collateral as well. Um, and I do apologize for sending a new version only yesterday, but I have been working quite extensively on this project. And um, yes, so thanks nevertheless uh, for, for your very helpful comments. Um, um, we always get this comment that uh, there is the financial crisis and that it, uh, it, it is a confounding factor and we have to take care of it. So. What we normally do is that we, we shorten the event horizon just to the end of 2007, but I'm totally aware that uh, the crisis started before. There's also papers out there by Rochol and Puri showing that German banks already had difficulties in, in, in um, the autumn of 2007. So um, indeed, what we argue uh, is that it's, it's Given that we assume a positive shock to uh, bank funding, uh, we find a positive um, uh, credit supply, this sort of confounding factor might at most bias our results downwards. And, and this is a bit what you have argued, right? And so if we cannot convince you that the financial crisis uh, happened in 2008, uh, then uh, indeed at most it biases our results a bit downward. That's, uh, that, that we have to admit indeed. Um, uh, about what banks pledge, uh, so I, I, I started this project as a PhD student and I did not have data on, on what banks actually pledge at, at the ECB. Uh, um, so we could obviously just, uh, just um, build a proxy. However, we look at, um, as, as, a, as a proxy, and we also have this in the data, we look at um, the increase in non-marketable assets, which are mainly bank loans uh, before and after the framework change. And you can really see that they doubled. Uh, in, in the ECB collateral data. So this is at least, even though we don't have the, the bank level information, it is at least a hint that, you know, something changed uh, in, 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 in what banks pledged and they used this. However, it's a very aggregated measure. Um, yeah, and on the cross-border lending, we will, uh, and also when it comes to competition, uh, we will we will definitely have a look in this uh, point well taken. And also your first point on the first order effect of um, if it really improved monetary policy. Also this, it's a point very well taken, thank you. Um, yes, and the real effects we are working on, on, on getting more out there. Basically, that's that's the that's the construction works right now. Uh, they are right there. Thank you. Then I would go to the to the audience. But uh, again, Loriana, thanks for for for, for your comments. Um, the affected. Uh, it's uh, what we what we do is. Um, uh, uh, I wouldn't talk about double counting, to be honest, because I would not understand why uh, an unaffected uh, would find it. Uh, um, it, why an unaffected banks uh, would um, uh, be, be, be negatively affected by it. 
this, 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 you have to explain it a bit more. Because if, if uh, basically uh, we distinguish, our measure distinguishes between banks uh, which are doing cross-border activity in, uh, to other Euro area countries and banks which are not really doing it. So it's banks mainly focusing on, on domestic activities, right? So our extinction is basically between more international banks and, and less international banks. And so um, th th that's, that's the distinction we do. So I, I wonder where this... So basically, basically we're running out of time, so we can talk at, at, at the break. But yeah. think about the, the competition and the new entrants for, for this market. Well, the incumbents are going to be affected by this uh, new one, but we can. Uh, okay, yeah, it. totally. And uh, also for the for the uh, risk sharing, um, uh, thanks thanks a lot for pointing out the FDI part of it. Uh, I uh, I was not aware, but we will look into this. Yeah, thank you, Francesco. Okay, thank you, Pia. Thank you, thanks. Doriana. Uh, many thanks also uh, to to uh, participants for the questions and the interest in the paper. Um, so we conclude our session on collateral uh, here. Uh, we'll take a, a break, a coffee break, until half past 11, and we'll be back with a session on REPL. So um, perhaps you can join me in, in thanking all presenters. <laughs>